الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه We will be beginning surah al-Sad inshallah surah number 38 If you're following this uh, translation Ahmad Zaki Hamad, page 761. A'udhu mm-hmm. billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sa'd. Wal-Qur'an dhikr The letter Sa'd is like the other letters that come in the beginning of surahs. We don't know what it means. They are known as the huruf muqatta'at or the broken letters. They're broken away from any composition and they stand independently. We recite them the way we recite the letters in the Arabic alphabet. So this is recited as Sa'd, the letter Sa'd. Wal Qur'an is the dhikr by the Qur'an, which is one of a reminder, which is one of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken an oath by the Qur'an that whatever I'm going to say afterwards, is going to be endorsed by the Qur'an itself. So the qasam or the oath is taken on the holy book, the divine command that is a revelation from Allah, referring to that whatever is going to be revealed hereafter will be a revelation, but it has a description here, that is the dhikr. The description of the Qur'an here is that it is one of reminder and one of knowledge that it is a book that came to remind people of their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to remind them that they have to worship Him and to remind them that there are rules of guidance and so it is a complete reminder. One of the names of the Quran is a dhikr. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the dhikr, meaning the Quran. It also refers to knowledge that the Quran uses the word ahlu dhikr uh, to refer to the people of knowledge, uh, people who know and understand and take heed. So this is the description Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for the name which is the Qur'an. And it is with this Qur'an that Allah is swearing and taking an oath. So you can see the uh, enormity of the oath and the qasam here. بَلِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاقٍ The truth of the matter is those who disbelieve they are in some form of self-glory and also in disparity, defiance, disparity, disunity. That they are averse to remembering and they are averse to being reminded. Izza can mean many things here. So we see here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that there are groups of people who even though they listen to the Qur'an and they understand what the words of the Qur'an mean. The Qur'an is revealed in a pristine Arabic which the Quraysh knew and understood and they spoke that language but despite being conversant with the language and with the metaphors and the similes and with the examples they could not adhere to the idea of the Qur'an being one of dhikr. 
one of the reminders. So it's not just that you need to understand the words, it is you need to have an appreciation for who is revealing the book. If you don't appreciate who's revealing, then definitely you will be in a state of self-glory and you will be in a state of arrogance and you will be in a state of uh, what is it, compound ignorance where you believe you know something when you don't know something. So this is a state of those who do not wish to remember Allah and those who do not wish to be guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also shiqaq means that they have internal differences, uh, that they are disunited, that even in, within their own theories and ideologies, uh, they are not united. They are disunited and they are incoherent when it comes to appreciating the truth. So the truth will be one and the truth which is conclusive uh, will be definitely one and absolute but when people roam around the world and they present the world with their ideas, ideals and their theories, they are disunited meaning they're never on the same page and that's why uh, you have so many theories out there and some theories will contradict the other theories and that's how you get the word shikhaq that's a state of kufr so in a state of denial and disbelief you will never agree to uh, what's known as the truth you will always differ about the truth and you'll always be disunited about a certain position the Quran since the Quran is revealed by the ultimate truth Al-Haq who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always bring you to a common ground and a understanding of the absolute truth. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the Quran. And the Quran brings people through the idea of dhikr and remembrance to a complete whole and a complete truth. That there have been so many people uh, before them that we have destroyed. So many generations before them uh, we have destroyed. Meaning that when you look into human history and you look into the decline of civilizations and when you look into the destruction of people and when you look into how uh, people then disintegrated and how communities lost their way and then they finally ended up in rubble and in ruin. That should be a lesson, that should be a means of dhikr, re remembrance. That uh, those of you, uh, mashallah, who are able to travel the world and the earth and they go and see all these ruins and relics and all of that. One is that you enjoy that. Uh, and the other is that you take heed and say, these were great civilizations, where are they now? Who took them away? If their purpose was to demonstrate their glory and their power, where is their glory and power today? It is no longer there. So here the Quran is uh, giving some ad ad admonition with regards to people who came before us that uh, when we want to evaluate ourselves, usually it's a good gauge to evaluate ourselves with people who came before us. So the Quran mentions this several times, and this is one time where the Quran says this, Fanado, and they all then cried out as they were being destroyed. Wala tahina manas. Uh, there's no place now left where they can run and run away. Manas is a place to where you run and where you flee. That means not. There is not a place where they can go and flee and save themselves and protect themselves when the final destruction comes. There's nothing you can do except to worship Allah and to cling to Allah's power, the power of the absolute and so on. So Allah save us and protect us uh, from all of these natural disasters and calamities and man-made disasters and calamities also because at that time, God forbid, there's no place to run. 
as we are witnessing in this country at the moment. So we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, this is a dhikr, this is a reminder. The Quran reminds people this is who is in charge. Allah is in charge and you must appreciate that when you are in trouble, you must revert back to the one who can help you. But human beings unfortunately don't do that. They rely on insurance and they rely on rebuilding and they rely on everything else that is not God. Min yeah. dunillah, anyone besides Allah, uh, they can rely on, but they want to rely on Allah because there's no sense of admonition, there's no sense of dhikr mm, within them. And that is the point. This ayah or these ayat were revealed at a time when uh, Abu Talib, the Prophet his uncle, was on his deathbed. And the Quraysh came to plead with him to tell uh, his nephew, who is Muhammad, وسلم, that he must stop condemning. Uh, the idols and he must stop condemning their mode and form of worship and Abu Talib being on his deathbed wanted to see the Prophet وسلم, but they wouldn't allow the Prophet وسلم, to come near the bed of Abu Talib and they stopped him, prevented him and the Prophet وسلم, still managed to make da'wah and give the Quraysh da'wah and said there's only one Allah, there's only one uh, true Ma'bud and one whom we worship and then he mentioned La ilaha illallah at that time the Quraysh came out and they made a few comments which has been uh, reported here mm, in ayah number 5 where they said وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ and they are amazed by the fact that a p person who is warning them can be from them min hum that we raise this person, this person grew up in front of our eyes, we saw how he was and how he was raised and who he was and that he had no schooling, he did not read or write and they saw uh, everything, how the Prophet Sallallahu behaved and interacted and they saw that there was really nothing wrong with him until he started to claim that he's a Nabi and when he started to claim he's a Nabi he started to say things that were uh, uh, non-conforming, not conforming with society and with the culture. And he started this revolution called Islam. So they were amazed that they could be from them, that he was one of them. And those who disbelieved, they say that this person here is only a magician and he's a liar. He's a sorcerer, he's a magician, he's a liar. So now when you say that the most honest person on the planet is a liar, then you know you have problems. When you say that the most trustworthy person on the planet is someone who's a magician and a sorcerer, then you know that you're in trouble. Uh, so the more the Prophet ﷺ claimed that there was no God except Allah, and the more he promoted his nabuwa, his prophethood, the more they became stubborn, the more they rebelled, and the more they resented him. And they came out with all of these allegations and all of these atrocities. And obviously, when the Prophet ﷺ is listening to this, uh, we must not assume that uh, he was a machine, that you can say something to a human being, and the human being would not be impacted or influenced by the statements. Mm. He's a human being, the Prophet ﷺ. So when people are condemning him, he's feeling the pain. Yeah, this is one point, unfortunately, sometimes we kind of overlook when we say we have to make sabr. Mm -hmm. When is it that you make sabr, which will be uh, presented later on in the next story, mm -hmm. or a few stories actually. Yeah. So when, when, when you are insulting somebody, then you feel the pain because you're human. You go through the emotion. Right? And then when you accuse somebody of lying and slandering, then you feel even more pain. And when you condemn that person to be a magician and sorcerer, disuniting the community in which he lives, 
Then you can imagine the pain and the agony the Prophet is experiencing. You must bring in the human element into the discussion. It's not that you read in the book, the Quraysh said this, and the Prophet did this. No, bring some life into it. So when, when, you ha when you live the experience as we do, God forbid somebody comes and says something negative to us in our faces, we feel the pain. Immediately, instantaneously, it's there. And the more severe the criticism, and the more severe the allegation, the more severe the pain. So here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ Those who disbelieved is referring to those who disbelieved in Muhammad sallallahu Those who disbelieved in him, those who did not recognize him, they said this. Yeah. One is to not recognize Allah, and the other is not recognize the Prophet. So those who did not recognize the Prophet, they insulted him, and they tortured him with these words, which is a very common form of torture. As we all know, words go a very long way. Right? We can kill somebody with words. Words are detrimental, and words are lethal. So when the Quran is narrating this, the Quran wants the reader to appreciate the immense pain the Prophet uh, undertook and also the immense sabr and patience he had to bear. This is the objective of the ayah. He said he's a, he's a sahir and a kadhab, he's a liar, and you just move on. Live the experience and see what it takes to deliver a message from Allah. You have to be a man of dhikr in order to appreciate what's going on here. You have to be a person who is connected to Allah and then concerned about the future of your people if you say you are a prophet of Allah and you are a man of God. Okay. It doesn't work in a vacuum, so we have to bring in the human element in our discussions. So when they said this is a sahir, a magician, a sorcerer, obviously it pained the Prophet immensely that I'm here to connect people to Allah and they're telling me that I'm doing this. So where is now my place of refuge? And obviously the place of refuge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and Allah is in the abstract. Right? You can't cuddle God and say, give me a cuddle, I'll feel fine. No? no. Then you have to rely on your salat. You have to rely on your dua. You have to rely on your dhikr, which is all abstract. <laughs> yeah, so you go from the concrete to the abstract, and that is the point of developing a nabi, developing a prophet through the Qur'an. <laughs> this is their statement, which the Qur'an now uh, is informing us. They came out and they said, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَاهٌ wahida." That has he made all the gods into one god? So for them it was totally alien that there could be only one source of divinity. And that divinity was not distributed into other deities and that God had no partners. Okay? It was baffling to them, it was amazing to them, and it was very alien to their culture, their psyche, their system of life and their system of thought. They could not grasp the idea that someone would actually worship one God. <coughs> That's why they were living in shirk. So then they said this, and the Quran again is narrating their statement for many reasons. Ilahu wahida. It's meaning that when Muslims read this ayah, they must also look into themselves and see where are they distributing the divinity of God in their lives. It may not be in stone and idols, but it may be in figureheads and figures and people that in their lives they are distributing divine powers into others who are above them, uh, who are in command of them, who are in charge of their livelihood or in charge of their social life or in, char in charge of their lives, whatever. This is the point of dhikr, you know, that the, you, you are reminded that 
the story of the Quraysh saying this to the Prophet is a parable. Right? The story happened in Sirah. But now from the story you draw a likeness from that story to your state and your condition and say, okay, what are the similarities between me and that story? And that's how you develop the sense of ibrah and uh, uh, you know, moral reasoning and comparative understanding of how this influences me. Just is, is not that you state this as a fact. They said this. Okay, they said that. Now, what's the point of revelation? That's a factual statement. The Quraysh came out and they said this, that he's made all the gods into one god. Okay. Now, when the reader reads this, there has to be something else besides that statement of fact. And that something else is the moral lesson that you must draw from that statement to your condition. That's how you get the dhikr. Well, Quran is the dhikr. The Quran is the means of dhikr. And you're reminding you, hey, you mustn't become like that. Now, as I said, you may not have idols and stones, but you may have ideals and people and uh, people who are above you, etc., your society, your community, who may be regulating your lives in such a way that is almost like appropriating divinity to those ideals or social norms and so on. <laughs> this, they said, is an amazing thing. It is bewildering that someone could do this and say that there's only one being who takes care of everything in the universe. How can that be? And when you step back and think of this, it is amazing that Allah Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do everything. And He takes care of everything and everyone. He is Rabbul Alameen. And He does what He does the way He does because He is who He is. And the more you think about it, the more you see it is amazing. So the Quran is now using their statement to show that indeed it is an amazing phenomenon that Allah alone does all of this. And how can He create the sun, the moon, the stars, the, sun, the sky, the earth, all the rain and the water and everything that's on earth, in earth? And how can He then regulate everything in the cosmos as one individual being? And that is who you submit to and say, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than everything. So that is, it is shayun al jab. It's an amazing thing. So the Quran is now turning their statement against them by saying that, yes, what you said is true, but not the way you said it. Mm. And then they used another strategy. The Quraysh were not, uh, you know, unable to, 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 to um, do social engineering. That's what it's called. Huh? They were able to turn the tide against Muhammad وسلم, and they were able to manipulate the situation to their advantage and they would use these means of, of uh, changing the ideas behind words by using the same words. Okay? And that was their skill set because they are the masters of language. Okay? The Quraysh were the masters of language. And they did this, they manipulated and they spread rumors in such ways uh, that uh, the ordinary person who was innocent would not be able to see their intention. <coughs> so the Quran mentions this. وَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ That the chiefs and the elders amongst them, they went around and they started walking. انطلقه. They went around campaigning. So when the Quraysh and the people who disbelieved Muhammad saw uh, that this uh, movement, if it gains momentum, will totally destroy us, our lifestyle, our culture, then they had to do something to counter it. So there was a strategy. And they always met to discuss their strategies. It was not that all of a sudden they thought of this. No, no. They were organized. So this is referring to the organized strategies of the Quraysh, that the mala, the chiefs of this group, meaning the people who were there in Mecca, outside of Mecca, they all relied on the administration and the governance of the Quraysh, and the Quraysh came out with this plan, uh, with this strategy, and with this agenda. Animshu. Okay. Now what? We should now walk. Yeah. We should now walk. Animshu. We should proceed. 
go about into the bazaar, go about into the sukh, go about with our social lives, and wherever we go, uh, we should now use this phrase, wasbiru ala alihatikum. Be patient with your gods. Hold steadfast to your gods. So on one side, they are saying that patience is a virtue, and the way we are going to observe patience is by being steadfast with our idea and our shirk and our worship of false gods. We are going to tell people to remain firm and be convinced that this is the way we are going to remain against this one person, one man, who seeks to destroy us from within. That's their strategy. So they use the word sabr. Okay? This is in the very clever manipulation of the word sabr uh, that you see how their minds worked and their evil geniuses. And it worked because that's what they did. And that's what people did. Be patient uh, over your gods, with your gods. Remain firm with them. Don't give up the worship of your gods just because one man is saying that there's only one God. No, remain firm and stick with it. Yeah. Hang in there. Wasbiru ala alihatikum. Inna hadha la shayun yurad. Indeed, this is something that is intended. This is something that's going to be that's going to happen. Uh, that this one person wants to remove you from your worship of your God, if you remain firm, then uh, you will not be removed. That is something that is wanted and desired, yurad. Or it could mean that this is a statement from Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now giving glad tidings to the Prophet wasallam that no matter how firm and patient they remain on their worship, it will be that they will one day worship one God. Uh, we have not heard anything like this in our previous religion. In our previous civilization, we have not heard anything like this, meaning all our fathers, grandfathers, and great grandfathers, and our predecessors, they all worshipped these idols. How can this one person now come out from within us and claim that there's only one God? This is not something that has a precedent. There's no precedence for what he is saying in our culture, in our history. So what he is saying is an innovation. In هذا إلا اختلاق This is nothing except fiction and an innovation. اختلاق Something that is created from the word خلق. So they came and they use this strategy to defend uh, their ways and their forms of worship and to uh, wreak havoc with the desire of Muhammad وسلم, and the Muslims that they use these words so that they would be able to, to fool people into believing that what they believed in was the truth. So <coughs> this ayah shows that if you use a sensible argument in front of people, people will believe you and people will follow you. Yeah, yeah. As we all know, yeah, what's happening scenes today. If you have your base, then your base will always believe you and believe in you as long as you speak to that. So likewise, the Quraysh, were, they were speaking to their base. Maybe. But they were very good at it. <laughs> Being at the time of Hijra, uh, there were perhaps uh, about 100 Muslims. This is what happened in Mecca. So the Saad was revealed in Mecca. In Mecca, for 13 years, there were barely how many Muslims? 100. So what the Quraysh did worked. They were very successful. We must include that in our understanding of the seerah, that the Prophet ﷺ endured for 13 years in Mecca without apparently too much success. Because if you say there were 5,000 people in Mecca or 10,000 people in Mecca, then even if you say very, very conservatively, if only 5,000 people and only 100 believed, then you work out the ratio. It's not a pretty ratio, right? But yet the Quran is still being revealed. Two thirds of the Quran is revealed in Mecca. So if the purpose of revelation is that people should convert, then then why were they converting? You understand? I mean, you, th- th- this 
it helps you gauge the immense sabr and patience of the Prophet that despite all the odds he remained firm there's only 100 people with you so if I'm 100 people what are you going to do you're going to revolutionize the world <laughs> the Quran tells him that you are a warner for the worlds so where's the worlds I can't get 100 people to follow me right. so that is the endurance and the persistence of the Prophet some his sincerity the Quran is saying that they use these strategies and they plotted and they schemed against the Prophet so that he would not succeed. So whereas they succeeded in Mecca, they did not succeed afterwards. And that is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unzil alayhi dhikru min baynina. That is the dhikr, the Quran, now being revealed uh, in front of us. Yeah. Meaning that he is he the one that is now the recipient of the Quran and no one else is chosen. If God wanted to appoint a messenger, then he should have appointed somebody with prestige, with honor, somebody with money and power and influence, or somebody whom the people looked up to as a leader. And this one person that he claims as Nabi has none of that. There is the dhikr of the Quran being revealed to him from amongst us. That is ajeeb. Okay, that is very, very strange that God would select such a person who is basically an entity. He really doesn't exist. Nobody really bothered with Muhammad except they said that he's a trustworthy person. But he wasn't influential. He wasn't powerful. He wasn't learned in the sense that he knew how to read and write. He wasn't a poet. Okay? He wasn't part of the Quraysh leadership. He was a miskin almost until he got married. After he got married, he got some prestige and he got some money, but that was it. So now they're, 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 they're dumbfounded as to how divine selection works. But divine selection works on your inner abilities not your exterior abilities, not your outer abilities. It's not what society thinks. It is what you are. And since Muhammad is honest, trustworthy, dedicated to high standards of moral and ethical behavior, that is why Allah chose him as he chose all the other prophets based on this criteria. Balhum fi shakkim min dhikri. The truth is that they are in doubt about the revelation about my reminder, meaning the Qur'an. The reminder be, meaning the Qur'an. They doubt that this is a revelation. So they're, they're not looking into who revealed, they're looking into who received the revelation. They're looking into the recipient, they're not looking into the person who gave him the reminder, the one who's sending the reminder. So that's obviously a usual mistake, and that was the mistake of the Ahlul Kitab, also later on in Medina, where they looked at the person who received the Quran and they said, How can God choose this one from the Arab against us who are from the Banu Israel? And how can He favor them over us? So they were looking at the recipient, they weren't looking at the one who gave. So the Quran condemns them for the same reason He's condemning the Quraysh. They are in total doubt about my revealing the Quran, dhikri, my revelation, my reminder. Uh, rather, they have not yet tasted the punishment that is to come to them in the form of Badr. Okay, this is a prediction for the punishment the Quraysh faced at the Battle of Badr, which came true. Meaning that if you constantly go against reminders and you constantly go against the messenger, the one who receives the divine because the divine has selected him, then you will end up in trouble. And that's what they did. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now reassuring the Prophet وسلم, that one day his sabr and patience will pay off. But that for the Prophet وسلم, in real time, 
is an unknown future. All he, all he has is his belief in Allah, his trust in Allah. He doesn't see the signs for anything in front of him. He seems to be trapped in Mecca where he can't do anything. Or do they have with them the treasure, treasures of the Rahmah of your Lord, the mercy of your Lord, okay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls these treasures that are in the heavens and the earth, and he controls where he sends his Rahmah and his help. Why? Because he is Al-Aziz. He is the mighty, the supreme. Al-Wahhab, he is the one who gives for no reason. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reassuring the Prophet sallam that rely on the names and attributes of Allah because they rely on the deities and you must rely only on the one. Okay, so they distributed divine powers into these deities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you don't need to divide those powers into them. You can just rely on one person, one being, who has all of these powers. He has the power of might and strength and supremacy, and he has the power of giving. Wahhab. Wahhab is someone who gives without reason. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he helps you, he will help you without reason. When he gives you, he will finally give you without any reason, which will be discussed further on, later on in the surah, when we discuss the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Right. So we, we see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now understanding the social context within the Prophet وسلم, is engaging. And that social engagement should not uh, distract him from the worship of one and from relying on Allah. The abstract powers of Allah are much greater than anything that society can throw at him. Amlahum mulku samawati wal ard wa ma baynahuma. Or is it that they own and control the kingdom of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between the two? Meaning, no, they don't control. They don't own anything. Allah owns everything. Allah's sovereignty is with everything. Everything is his creation. Everything is his property. And everything is under his control. We believe that, and all the prophets believe that. وَمَا فِي الْأَسْبَابِ so now, if they don't believe, then they should maybe climb up into the heavens and see. Fil asbab refers to the heavens, the means, literally. Let them climb and ascend into the means and the heavens so that they can see who's controlling the heavens and who's controlling the earth. All of this is a matter and a reminder for the Prophet ﷺ to come back to Tawheed. Stay with Tawheed is also a reminder for the reader that in uh, the reader's own individual life, uh, he should, uh, she should just remain firm with Allah's tawheed oneness. That Allah, the one, can do everything. It's a matter of patience and perseverance, a matter of trust, and a matter of doing things the way they should, so that the desired result and effect comes down. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet in the surah, and then finally the promise. جُنْدٌ مَا هُنَالِكَ مَهْزُومٌ مِّنَ الْأَحْزَابِ جُنْدٌ That there will be mere host and there will be just a few scattered people who have a very meager army. Meager hosts. مَا هُنَالِكَ Over there. Meaning at the time of Badr, there will be mahzum. They will be scattered and they will vanquish. They will be defeated. Mahzum. So there will be a bunch of defeated people uh, that they have their con confederates and their groups. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to the Prophet وسلم, one day. And then he will see that even though at Badr they were still uh, marginalized. Okay, the number was one to three. They were in the minority even in Badr. That didn't matter to the divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them their victory at Badr because they held fast to the principles of Tawheed, believed in Allah, trusted Allah, and they, they sought uh, madad and help from Allah. Uh, so now all of this, this is a prelude obviously to what's going to come later on in the surah. But the initial purpose is to address the idea that first the Quran is a book of dhikr. 
a book of reminder, the dhikr, a book that reminds you to remember Allah. Dhikr means remember, it's a dhikr. You remember Allah, that's your dhikr. So the Quran is a reminder to people that they should remember Allah at all times. At all times. And once you have this mindset and this psyche, you will benefit from the words, from the knowledge of the Quran. But if you don't have this mindset, then you may understand the words and you may understand some of the arguments, but you will not benefit from that because you don't want to. Uh, so there's obviously there's this academic understanding and then there's this Islamic understanding. Two different camps and nowadays unfortunately people, if they are into academic stuff, if they are, not many people are, but even if they are into academics, it's just the words. They don't want to put anything into practice. There's no amal there, there's no fruit. It's like a tree which is bearing no fruit. So you may have the academics and the branches and all the leaves, but if there's no fruit on the tree, you will not benefit from your own tree. So the Quran is telling people that first and foremost, you must trust Allah and you must remember him and you, you must understand why he is revealing these ayat and why he is revealing these stories. The stories carry a message to you, the reader. It's not simply a lesson in history. So more than often, when we read the seerah, and when we read some of the ayat of the Qur'an that are based on seerah, we see it as a book of history. Uh, this happened in history. We don't usually calculate and measure the amount of wisdom that should come over to us in our lives and make it a practical application of the ayah in our lives. Inshallah, since this is the first, inshallah, uh, of this semester, here and we make a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to benefit from the Quran, the Quran which is based on dhikr. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.